I'm very happy to, to chair this uh, last session of uh, a wonderful workshop. And uh, we will have uh, two theory talks that uh, are followed by a plenary lecture by a pioneer in the field. And uh, we, we close finally with the Pulitzer Prize presentation. So um, the first uh, talk of a theorist is uh, by Troy von Forrest from MIT. And Troy is going to talk about energy transfer between molecules and quantum dots. Please, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure to, uh, to give, a, give a talk. It's been a great uh, conference so far, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to the talks uh, the rest of today. Uh, so I'm going to, as is probably the case for many folks who are giving talks here, I, I gave this talk title, I think, you know, I, I, a year and a half ago, I don't know, quite a long time ago, uh, and then I've added to it. So it's not that the talk has changed so much as that it, I, we, we'll talk about energy transfer between molecules and quantum dots, but we'll talk about some other things too. Uh, and so I'm going to start off with a motivation for why we're going to talk about uh, talk about several things uh, within this talk. And the motivation I'm going to use is um, energy up conversion, and I'll explain why I think that's interesting and useful, uh, and why I think it might be interesting to this the, the folks in this audience in particular. Uh, and then I think that and that will segue into talking about uh, energy transfer between molecules and nanocrystals, and then finally the the, the idea of triplet triplet energy up conversion and its efficiency. So first, I want to talk about uh, energy up conversion uh, and why this is interesting. So energy up conversion is uh, a relatively simple idea. It's the idea is to absorb, to have a material that absorbs two low energy photons and creates one higher energy electron hole pair. Uh, so uh, the first place where this is obviously useful is in solar energy conversion. So uh, as, as if you have a silicon solar cell uh, that has, has a band gap, uh, there's two major inefficiencies in that cell. One is the problem of very high energy photons that all relax down to the band edge and don't give you as much voltage uh, from those high energy photons as you would like. Uh, that, and in order to solve that, you try to use a, a process called down conversion, where you would take a high energy photon and effectively split it into two uh, to create two electron hole pairs. But then there's also this very, very large portion of the solar spectrum that falls below the band gap for silicon. Uh, and therefore doesn't get absorbed by the, by the solar panel if you have one up on your roof. And so there the challenge is to try to take those low energy photons and convert them into some form of usable energy that, that you, could, you could harness with your solar panel. Uh, so that's one possible application of, of this up conversion process. Uh, but there are a number of other ones. So uh, another place where there's a lot of interest in up conversion right now is in uh, sensing in the shortwave IR. So uh, the, the shortwave IR is, as this picture indicates, is currently the favored technology for autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, uh, because it's less uh, susceptible to uh, particulate interference. Um, uh, and so uh, there's a great demand for cheap uh, shortwave IR cameras uh, that, can, uh, that can communicate and receive signals uh, in the shortwave IR. Um, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to find materials that directly uh, uh, observe these shortwave IR, but if you could somehow up convert, uh, say, two shortwave IR photons up into the visible, then you could just use visible cameras in order, visible things that detect visible uh, photons in order to uh, indirectly observe the shortwave IR. So that's another potential application for up conversion. And finally, the third kind of application of upconversion, uh, which is slightly different, uh, is actually in organic LEDs. Uh, in organic LEDs, of course, you're not absorbing photons, but uh, you're emitting photons, so it's a reverse process. But in many uh, organic LEDs, a lot of the blue light that you actually see from the, from the LED uh, typically comes from upconversion. In other words, there's, there's, there's two excitons that would otherwise emit in the red. They collide with each other and then uh, create a single high energy uh, exciton on a third emitter uh, that emits in the blue. Um, uh, and, and so at, certainly at high drive, as, as you would see, for example, in a white light organic LED, uh, it's, it's quite clear that some form of up conversion is happening, although it's very difficult to say how much in practice. So I hope I've, I've, I've whetted your appetite and convinced you that up conversion is interesting. So, uh, so why do I think up conversion would be interesting to, to this audience? Well, the, the reason I think up conversion is interesting to this audience is that organic molecules, I think, are quite clearly the most promising up conversion materials that exist. 
Uh, and the reason is, is that there's this process of triplet, triplet annihilation that goes on in organic materials, uh, where you say, all right, I suppose I have two molecules in their lowest triplet state, uh, and they're next to each other. Uh, then when these two exotoms run into each other, uh, there is a process by which these two, as these two things run into each other, they pool their energy on just one of the molecules, the left-hand molecule, and create a, a singlet excited state on the left molecule, uh, and the right-hand molecule gives up its energy, gives, push, pushes it over into the other molecule. And then what you've created uh, is a state that, that's in the singlet state. And as most organic molecules in singlet excited states do, uh, it can then emit that high energy uh, photon for you. And so for this to work, uh, you need several things. You need your triplet states to be long lived uh, so that they can live long enough to run into one another. Uh, that again is something that organic systems are quite uh, good at because spin orbit coupling is weak, so triplets are long lived. Now it also requires your triplet at your triplet energies to be situated such that twice the triplet energy gives you enough energy to create S1. Uh, and again, this is typically the case uh, for organic molecules. Uh, there's of course occasionally molecules that satisfy the opposite, where uh, they, and those molecules are quite interesting for singlet fission. Uh, but everything that's not a good singlet fission molecule is potentially a good triplet triplet annihilation candidate. Uh, and then finally, the thing that it requires is uh, on the right hand side, this singlet excited state is only going to emit if uh, S1 to T1 inter system crossing is slow. Uh, and again, organic molecules typically have quite slow inter system crossing because spin orbit coupling is weak. Uh, and so, uh, or this is uh, again just a, a an advertisement that says, all right, well, this is a conference about organic materials, and this is an, an electronic process in organic materials that is really where, you know, we, we, it, it's almost a no contest. Uh, organic materials are better than inorganic materials here at this upconversion process. Now, uh, there is a challenge, however, which is that in order to have triplet triplet annihilation occur, you've got to generate these triplets. And of course, uh, the, the downside of the organics is that the triplets themselves are not very absorptive, so you can't very easily generate uh, those triplet states directly, so you need to have some kind of sensitization of these, uh, of these molecules in order to get this, uh, this kind of upconversion to happen. And so I'm going to give you a picture of a, of a device here that's aimed at doing exactly that, at trying to sensitize this triplet, triplet annihilation process. Uh, and then we're going to use this to try to go through the different, um, uh, the, to try to motivate some of the theoretical uh, investigations that I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of this talk. So this is a device uh, that was made uh, in with with in collaborate in Munji in a collaboration between Munji Buendi's group at MIT and Mark Baldo's group, um, and it's uh, it's a it's a it's a layer of lead sulfide nanocrystals, uh, so small chunks of uh, colloidal lead sulfide nanoparticles uh, deposited on glass. Uh, they absorb in the sort of seven to 800 nanometer range. Uh, so in that sort of IR range of photons. Um, so that, and it's this, on top of that layer they've, of nanocrystals, they've got a layer of rubrine. Um, uh, and uh, and um, the, the device is, ma is made so that uh, they, you can shine the 785 nanometer light on the nanocrystals. That light is absorbed on the nanocrystals, creates excitons on the nanocrystal, which energy transfer, uh, it's a dexter type energy transfer, into the rubrine to create triplets on the rubrine. Uh, and then the triplets that you create on rubrine can undergo triplet triplet annihilation to create singlets, which then emit at 610 nanometers. So you've then accomplished the up conversion that you sought, which is that you put in low energy photons here, and you're getting out higher energy photons here. Uh, and so they, they made this device, uh, and it works pretty well in a quantum efficiency manner. And so they wanted to understand uh, some, of, some of the processes by how it worked and how to optimize it. And so we, we were doing the theory on this. And there's a number of really theoretically interesting questions here that we wanted to answer. Uh, the first, which is was part of the title, is this question of how you actually get energy transfer from these nanocrystals into the organic layer. Uh, that's something that I think is theoretically pretty poorly understood right now, and we wanted to try to answer that. And then there were some secondary, second questions about this, just this process of triplet triplet annihilation. Ob observationally, we know it occurs. Uh, we have some fairly good spectroscopy of it. 
but then having sort of an understanding of what can cause efficient TTA was, was, was the second, is the second thing we're, we were interested in. Uh, so those are the two remaining things I want to talk about, which is the step of energy transfer between a molecule and a nanocrystal, and then the triplet-triplet up conversion process. So in order to look at this energy transfer process, um, my group is well known for using a technique known as constrained DFT. Um, and uh, I think we've heard a few people men, at least mention that uh, at various points during the, the conference so far. But I'll just note how you can use constraints to study triplet energy transfer. Um, in triplet energy transfer, triplet energy transfer looks very much like electron transfer. Uh, it still has a Marcus-like picture. It's just that in, instead of uh, having charge moving from one molecule to another, what we think about is we think about having spin move from one molecule to another. Uh, because as is the case with most organic molecules, most organic molecules are spin compensated. They're closed shell. Uh, so there's no net spin. Uh, and so when you create a localized triplet excitation, you create localized spin, sort of an M sub S locally that is not zero. And so we can apply a constraint uh, and say, if I want to look at a triplet energy transfer from molecule A to molecule B, I can create one state where I constrain that net spin to be on the left-hand molecule, and that creates this left-hand state. Uh, and then I can do a second calculation where I constrain the net spin to be on the right-hand molecule, uh, and that creates this right-hand state, which has a sort of free energy that looks like the red curve. And then I can characterize things like the driving force for triplet energy transfer or the reorganization energy associated with triplet energy transfer uh, from these states. But the thing that's going to be most important for uh, today's discussion is that we can use this to compute, also use this to compute the coupling between the, uh, for triplet energy transfer. So the coupling between the initial and final states. Uh, and we do this simply by noting that on the left-hand side, I've created a wave function. On the right-hand side, I've created a wave function. And I can sandwich the Hamiltonian between those two wave functions to get the electronic coupling between the initial and final states. And so for something like triplet energy transfer, uh, then I can say, you know, if I use a Marcus-like expression, the rate of energy transfer is proportional to the coupling squared times some classical density of states. Um, but again, for today, the main thing I'm going to be focusing on this is this coupling. Uh, but once you have those couplings, you can do things like uh, look at diffusion of triplets uh, in, in an organic material. So here's, for example, triplet diffusion in tetracine. We're in, uh, in mimicking an experiment where you would have a laser spot uh, on tetracine. And the size of this initial spot here is about the size of a diffraction limited um, laser uh, pulse on, on the material. And you can then watch as after you've created triplets on the te on tetracine, how those things diffuse through the material. You can look at the anisotropy of the diffusion along the crystal lattice. Clearly, the diffusion is faster along this um, uh, anti-diagonal of, of the material in the way that we're, we're envisioning it here. Um, and so we can use these kinds of couplings to, to look at rates uh, of mo molecule to molecule triplet hopping. Um, and then from that, we can look at things like diffusion within a material as well. But now this isn't what I wanted to look at. I did not want to look specifically at triplet mobility within a material. What I wanted to look at was triplet hopping between uh, a nanocrystal and a material. That's the step that I, I'm interested in at the moment. Uh, and for that, I'll note that the experimentalists have some uh, we're able to do a really nice control uh, experiment that gives us some really granular data that we can we can we can analyze here. Which is, for these colloidal nanocrystals, there's always ligand there's always a ligand shell on the outside of these that was used to originally used to soluble solubilize the nanocrystals. Um, but they can take they can make them either with shorter ligands or longer ligands, and uh, the, clearly with the shorter ligands uh, the core of the nanocrystal can get closer to the rubric where so that we would expect faster energy transfer. And with longer ligands, you push the rubrines further away. So we would expect slow, slower energy transfer. And so they were so indeed they were able to do these experiments with a number of different ligands. Um, so this is a plot of the time scale uh, for triplet triplet for triplet energy transfer between the nanocrystal layer and the uh, rubric extracted through um, extracted experimentally uh, for uh, various lengths uh, of the uh, ligands on the outside of the nanocrystal. So going from a four carbon uh, shell, which is the shortest thing they have here, all the way up to 18 carbons. 
Uh, and it is plotted on a log linear scale, I'll note to you. Uh, and so log linear scales are nice because if something is exponential, then it shows up as a straight line. Uh, and I will note that because we are talking about triplet energy transfer and because the acceptor, the rubrine here is not very bright, uh, this is not uh, fluorescent uh, resonance energy transfer. So it doesn't have the one over R to the sixth one would expect for singlet energy transfer. We would expect this to have more of a, to be dependent more on wave function overlap and therefore to be, to be exponential with distance. And so we kind of are expecting for this, that, that if we plot this on a log linear scale, we would see a straight line. And, it, and indeed, uh, for, for a while here, sort of 18, 16, 14, 12, 10, um, you know, that, that up in this region, we see that it is indeed a straight line. Uh, but somewhere here at these shorter ligand separations, uh, there, the, the, the straight line behavior tails off. Uh, and we reach uh, sort of a speed limit uh, for triplet energy transfer of around 100 nanoseconds. Um, and so we wanted to investigate this. Uh, both we want to understand the, the exponential decay and the speed limit. So we'll focus first on this speed limit size side. So on the speed limit side, uh, there's, uh, there's at least one hypothesis about what could be causing this speed limit, which is maybe this is just the, the time scale at which nanocrystal molecule energy transfer happens. If a once the, when the molecule is sitting right on the surface of the nanocrystal, uh, maybe 100 nanoseconds is the time scale for uh, excitonic energy transfer in that case. Um, and so that's something that theoretically we can answer using exactly the tools I told you about mo a moment ago. Uh, if, you, if you say you're talking about the closest approach of these things, we can actually create uh, a nanocrystal uh, and just manually place the molecule as close to the surface of the nanocrystal as possible. Uh, that, you know, this may be even closer than, the, than it gets in the experiment, but, but this is sort of the, the best case scenario um, of here's how close the molecule can get to the nanocrystal. And then once we've, we've created this system, we can look at triplet energy transfer between these things in exactly the same way as one would look at triplet energy transfer between two molecules. It's just that the nanocrystal is just a very big molecule. And so we can create one state where the triplet is localized on the nanocrystal, uh, another state where it is localized on the molecule. And then we you know, create those two states. We compute the coupling between the two. We estimate the reorganization energy and the driving force. And then we can get um, a theoretical maximum rate for this kind of dexter energy transfer between the nanocrystal and the molecule. And what we get is that it's somewhere around 10 nanoseconds. Um, and that's uh, not very not consistent with the experimental result because the experiment says that the, the speed limit should be about 100 nanoseconds. Uh, and I'll note that on this time, this triplet triplet transfer time scale, uh, the difference between 100 nanoseconds and 10 nanoseconds is quite substantial. That would put uh, put the theoretical maximum somewhere down where my cursor is there, uh, which is you know perhaps not shockingly uh, quite uh, quite in line with what would happen if you extended the exponential. Uh, increase in speed from long ligands all the way down to very short ligand thicknesses. So our, our conclusion from this is that this is not an intrinsic speed limit. This isn't the, this this that we are not this system is not hitting uh, the fastest possible rate for triplet energy transfer between the quantum dot and the molecule. So something else uh, is limiting the speed the the time scale of of energy transfer, uh, and we actually uh, uncovered what we think is the right. Um, uh, right explanation in, in conjunction with another study that we did with um, Sean Roberts group and Minli Tang, uh, where they were actually able to create something where they could tether the molecule to the surface of the quantum dot um, so that then they could get a more controlled geometry for triplet energy transfer. And we did the same kind of simulations for them. And as we did that, what we found was uh, something interesting, which is that, uh, I guess I should go back and note that here I pictured it as if there was only one triplet state uh, that we could find on the quantum dot, but that's not actually true. If we're careful uh, and, and, and try multiple different calculations, we can fairly easily get, um, I have only five minutes left. Wow, okay. Sorry about uh, this. We can, <laughs> we can, uh, we can, we um, can, uh, uh, we can get uh, multiple different triplets on this quantum dot. Uh, and so what we find is that, and if you look at those different triplets, 
Um, there's one triplet that's on the, that looks bulk-like, that's sort of spread out over the dot, and there are other triplets that appear on the surface. Um, and what we see is that some of the triplets are on the wrong side of the dot, uh, so far away from the molecule, those are going to have very short tra transfer times. Some are on the surface near the molecule, those are going to transfer very quickly. Uh, and then there are ones that are spread out over the dot that are going to transfer more slowly. And what, uh, uh, what Sean was able to show with his spectroscopic techniques is that actually the 100 nanosecond time scale has to do with um, interconversion of some of these in individual substates on the quantum, on the nanocrystal uh, needing to happen. So you need to actually land in one of these states that's near the molecule to get fast transfer. And it's the interconversion time scales that are somewhere around 100 nanoseconds, not the, not the transfer time. And we've actually been able to also show that, that th these types of surface states are really quite common. Uh, even if we make an ideal nanocrystal with no ligands on the outside or anything, we find these surface states. So this is just an illustration of the spectrum of, of a very pristine dot that we got recently, um, where there are huge numbers of these surface states. So there's, uh, there's this is the absorption spectrum just showing all of the different states. Uh, so we've got uh, all of the lines in the, uh, in the spectrum. And uh, clearly below the bright peak, which is way, way up here, there are just dozens and dozens of, of low energy states. And here's a picture of what one of them looks like. It's, it's, it's a surface hole going to a bulk electron kind of state. Uh, so there are really large numbers of surface states in these dots, and they, they really do mediate and determine the time scales of energy transfer. So we feel like we understand this speed limit. Um, the, the other mystery had to do with this exponential decay here, how fast and how that is. Uh, and one of the things that's puzzling is that this is actually quite, the exponential decay here is quite a bit slower than we would have thought it would have been. So we're seeing here transfer from something that's 18 carbons away into the nanocrystal. And that seems uh, quite far uh, for dexter energy transfer. Um, and we were able to also unravel this by look, working with, um, uh, with Munji Buendi on this. Uh, we did some molecular dynamic simulations on the ligand spheres uh, of these quantum dots. So this is, these are pictures of the same quantum dot core, the same nanocrystal core uh, with different ligand shells. So different lengths of ligand. So from three carbons all the way up to 17 carbons. And what you see is that for the shorter uh, ligands, the ligands are standing up and they're sticking out uh, from, the, it's a, it, from the nanocrystal. It's a spiky ball. Uh, and then as the ligands get longer, they eventually fall over, uh, forming what we would call, what one might otherwise call a hairball, where the, the ligands fall over the same way you might, you know, to happen when you comb your hair. And the result is that even though the ligand sphere, ligands are much longer here, the distance that you have to go to get to the core of the nanocrystal is not so small. Um, and so, in a, and this was actually unexpected. I think many people had thought for these uh, nanocrystals that the ligands were much more rigid and stuck, stuck straight out more. Um, but through careful analysis of uh, quantum dot arrays and the TEM structures, uh, they were able to confirm that the, the distance between the dots, uh, if measured, measured carefully um, in the TEM, if you compare that with the, the predicted thickness of these ligand spheres, uh, the agreement is really quite good. Um, and so this, the, the, if, the shell, if they stuck straight out, the experiment in theory would be along this black dotted line, but it's not uh, along that line. It's, it's along this, this red curve, uh, which shows the, the ligands falling over as they get longer. Uh, so that helped us to feel like we understood the, the ligands here. And I'm actually going to skip over this thing. We also, have done, we also did some kinetic modeling of this um, for multiple layers, which is somewhat less interesting. I do want to say something about triplet triplet up conversion uh, before I finish. Um, uh, and so uh, the, uh, the last step that here now is triplet triplet up uh, annihilation. And so I wanna e emphasize that there is a maximum efficiency for triplet triplet annihilation that comes from spin statistics. So if you have two triplets that run into each other, um, there's, there's of course the spin statistics problem that you started out with spin and you, you wanted to end up in a state that had, a, had a, a one singlet excitation and one singlet ground state. But uh, we know uh, that angular momentum coupling doesn't work that way. Uh, there's also the possibility that two triplets recouple to form a single triplet uh, or that they form a quintet. Uh, now the quintet state on a single molecule is not energetically accessible. It's very high in energy. And so this channel uh, at the bottom uh, is not doesn't really contribute, um, but you are left with this triplet channel and this singlet channel, which both are energetically accessible. And so 
Uh, you then want to try to take these these ratios, the fact that there's you know one night that one ninth possible probability of going this way statistically, three nights going this way, um, and that's my 20 minutes. So I'm now into question time. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish up quite quite, quite soon here. Um, and so you you do the do the calculation based on this, and you say, all right, my maximum efficiency in this case should be 40 percent. I shouldn't be able to get a higher triplet triplet a higher singlet fraction than, than 40% efficiency for this upconversion process. And that's a bit confusing because there are at least a couple of examples in the literature right now uh, of where we get higher than the statistical limit. So the triplet triplet efficiency for this diphenyl uh, anthracene molecule is reported as 50%. And then for rubrine, the very molecule we were just talking about, the efficiency is 60%. So higher than the statistical fraction. So how could this work? Um, well, the first hypothesis of how this could work uh, is that maybe it's just an energy situation. So maybe, uh, so you know, when you're making these triplets, maybe the the energy from two triplets doesn't line up very well for this triplet channel. So I've drawn that in the picture over here. You know, suppose the energy for two triplets comes right here, you wouldn't be able to make the T two state because it would be uphill, and then going all the way back down to a single triplet would be so much energy to dump it would probably be slow. Uh, so that would mean that this middle channel would be inaccessible and you would have theoretically possibly up to 100% efficiency. So that's one hypothesis, uh, and it would require that energy of the triplets to line up just so, uh, so that the T2 state was higher in energy than twice T1. Uh, and we can test this theoretically. So we, we went off and we did some calculations uh, for uh, diphenyl acetylene, uh, diphenyl anthracene and rubrine. Uh, and we compared this with anthracene and tetracene, the cores, just as a calibration point to see if our, our calculations were working relatively well. Uh, and we did that in particular because there's good experimental numbers for both anthracene and tetracene. And the long story short is that the, the numbers don't suggest that the energy is the killer here, uh, because the twice the energy of the triplet is either above T2 or about the same as T2. So we should be able to make T2 here. Uh, this channel exists. Uh, you can you can definitely make T two out of one, out of two triplets. Um, so then the other hypothesis about how this could be uh, how you could get higher than forty percent efficiency is if the inner system crossing is actually fast, because then what would happen is some of these T triplets that you make through this otherwise harmful channel could get recycled back into making useful singlets. Uh, now that wouldn't normally be the case. You wouldn't expect inner system crossing to be super fast here because these are organic systems. Um, but uh, we've done some some calculations that actually should actually demonstrate that this spin orbit coupling is actually anomalously large uh, for these phenyl substituted acenes. So uh, so that for example, just looking at rubrine, for example, going from tetracene to rubrine. Uh, increases the inner system crossing rate by almost four orders of magnitude. Um, so there's just a dramatic increase in the inner system crossing rate here, uh, which does dramatically increase the triplet triplet annihilate, annihilation rate, uh, rate to form singlets. So um, we have, and we have some molecular mechanisms for that, but I will skip that. Uh, and just uh, since I'm over time, I'll thank you for the time for, for listening. And I will uh, thank the folks in the group who worked on this, uh, most notably the Lexi McIsaac, uh, a graduate student who just finished, who's worked extensively on the quantum dots, uh, Andrew Kim, uh, and Si Cheng, who uh, a graduate student undergrad working on the TT annihilation. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Troy, for this very, very interesting talk. Now, I think we have a few femto seconds to answer the most urgent questions. Um, I guess one question by Sergey has already been answered. This was about the role of spin orbit coupling. You, you commented on this. Um, so another question by uh, Han Bei Yang. Have you looked at different size quantum dots? How does that yes, affect so the we, drop of migration rate? Yes, so we, we have looked at different quantum dots theoretically. Um, uh, at, and the main thing we've been looking at is the qualitative question of does the presence of these surface states vary uh, with the size of the dot? Because we because our calculation suggested as long as there are bright states and surface states that are somewhat segregated, the qualitative photophysics should be similar. Um, and so at least, you know, we have looked at various sizes of dot to, to, to verify that the surface states are still there. Uh, one of the difficulties in comparing with experiments changing the size of the dot is even our largest dots are still somewhat smaller than the smallest dots they make in the experiments. Um, so uh, we can't get to the experimental range where they, where, where, you know, the main thing they would change the size of the dots for is to change the 
the, the um, absorption wavelength, uh, but we can't quite get our dots that large, so. Yeah. Uh, then we have a very interesting comment by Vitaly Petsarov on um, work by Chris Bardeen, who has shown that uh, actually if you just take rubber in crystalline form, you uh, obtain a significant near infrared to vis up conversion. So maybe we just leave it at that. So please consult the uh, the, uh, the the chat for, for details. I, 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 I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll respond there. But I, 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 we're aware of that too. And it was actually quite difficult for our experimental collaborators to disentangle the transfer from this, this exact process. So, yes. And last femtosecond to answer to Samuel Giannini um, on the comparison CDFT with respect to a diabetization scheme like fragment spin difference. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that, that, uh, uh, a, well, actually, I'll answer that in the chat. So um, I, I, I don't want to run too far over time, but I, I can answer in the chat.